So I'm Rick Sherlock. Thanks very much for coming along this morning. Um, I wanted to spend a bit of time uh, talking to you a little bit about how Microsoft is transforming its talent acquisition team, um, some, of the, some of the changes that we've made recently to align ourselves with the new culture that we're aligning, you know, we're rolling out within our organization, some of the learns along the way. So it's a bit of a disclaimer. So sometimes you'll get speeches and they'll tell you about how to do things. If I'm honest, we're very much on this kind of journey as we go along. So we're, we're, we're kind of learning. There's a, there's a phrase that's thrown around a lot, which is, you know, uh, building a plane while trying to fly it. And it feels a little bit like that. So um, one of the reasons I wanted to kind of share with some of this with some of my colleagues in, in the industry is that I think the way that we assess and we select candidates today, you know, hasn't maybe changed as much as some of the other elements of recruitment. For example, sourcing has come on massively with the, inter with the internet and social. Assessment selection fundamentally, you know, we found that unless you kind of coach and train and develop managers can be very kind of traditional. And as a result, some of the hires that we're making, um, you know, per perhaps weren't some of, the, some of the best hires. So uh, transformational talent is one of those kind of buzzwords in the industry. And, and to give you guys the kind of Microsoft definition, transformational talent is how we are um, hiring different kinds of profiles with different kinds of backgrounds to enable us to transform and um, you know, accelerate our cultural transformation effectively. So within that, that encompasses things like you know, high potential talent, top talent in the industry, diversity um, talent, for example, and compete talent. So just a bit of a kind of a headline in terms of what that actually means. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk through five chapters, all right, to make it nice and straightforward. Before I um, kick on to what our assessment selection process now looks like, a little bit of background on Microsoft as an organization, okay? So Microsoft was set up in um, 1975. Um, and fundamentally, it was set up as um, a very innovative organization, a software development company. Um, and since that time, it's really massively grown over the years. Um, and this is Bill Gates here. Um, some pretty funky haircuts as well, some pretty big PCs. It hasn't necessarily always been known for being a particularly sexy organization, right? If I'm honest, productivity and sexy tend not to be in the same uh, category. Um, but nonetheless, it was very, very successful. And over the next kind of 35, 40 years, it kind of grew uh, to where it is today, which is a $94 billion you know, American organization, 120 companies you know, globally, uh, over 100,000 employees. Um, and it was doing well. So I joined in around 2013. And when I joined in 2013, the organization, it kind of reached a bit of a point where we were a little bit directionless. It felt a little bit like we needed a new um, approach. We needed to kind of reassess why we kind of existed as an organization. Um, and Microsoft, you know, fundamentally was profitable. We were making products people liked at the time. But culturally, I think we needed to kind of look at, you know, changing things around. So in 2014, um, we appointed a new uh, CEO um, it's called Satya Nadella, and he looked at he kind of reassessed what our company kind of big bets were. So basically, what you know why we existed as an organisation. We already created some some products that, frankly, a lot of our customers enjoyed and loved, um, and we continue to make some of these products. Fundamentally, we needed to change. The world around us had, um, you know, the te technology world around us had really kind of accelerated, and we needed to, you know, we needed to change and, and adapt what we were doing, and, and quite frankly, attract some different types of talent that we previously hadn't had. Um, so we looked at what we could do as a culture. I say we, I mean, personally, I didn't, but from the senior leadership team, we looked at how we adapt what our, what our culture should be from where it was today. So back in the day, 1975, the original kind of mission statement for Microsoft was you know, a PC on every desk, which then kind of evolved to be a PC in every home, which back, which back then was a pretty crazy mission statement, right? So uh, now it's clearly we have five PCs at home and two smartphones and you know, PCs in our cars. But back then, that was a pretty ambitious, bold bet. And it felt as though we were kind of missing our new mission statement. So through consultation as an organization, um, Satya kind of led this new view as to how we can, um, you know, all align behind a new mission statement. And, and this new mission statement was born, which is empower every person uh, on the planet and the organizations to achieve more. Okay? Kind of very succinct, clear, incredibly ambitious and bold. 
Um, and then everything kind of that we do as an organization now uh, you know, aligns behind that kind of mission statement. So to give you an idea, we've come up with these new connected bold ambitions. Um, as an organization, we're looking at reinventing productivity. We're looking at building the intelligent cloud platform and making more personal computing. So the organization, you know, obviously you, you come up with this new mission statement and new kind of ways of working, and yet the, the people within your org and the people that you're kind of recruiting in, they don't just suddenly change overnight. So we had to think, well, actually, how do we actually go about instilling that kind of cultural change within our org? Um, Satya kind of put it really well, and I, this is probably my favorite. Um, as a culture, we're moving away from a group of people who know it all to a group of people who want to kind of learn it all. And this, this kind of plays very much back to the original mentality of some of the um, you know, uh, people who've been with Microsoft for a long time when I joined. It felt a bit like we were still kind of in this era of we're a leading organization, you know, we, we, we don't have much of a challenger mindset. This world is changing around us, so therefore, you know, how are we going to compete kind of going forward? And this kind of notion of growth mindset it wasn't, wasn't championed by Satya, but it's something that as a culture is our most important asset now. Um, it, we look for people who have what we call a growth mindset, and I'll come on to what that kind of means in a bit more detail a bit further on. So we had, uh, when I joined, TA within, talent acquisition within Microsoft was a very different kind of beast, right? So it was, if I was to summarize it, fairly reactive, fairly one-dimensional in terms of we, were, you know, we, would, we would take a rec transactionally, fill the rec, move on to the next one. Um, and it was very clear that if we wanted to change um, our culture, we needed to hire different types of profiles. We needed a different approach from our TA perspective. Um, so we went through um, a very large transformation within our TA team. Um, and we came up with these five strategic pillars. Um, and I'll just kind of call them out and talk you through what each of them kind of means in a bit more detail um, and how that pertains to the assessment selection process. So the first one, we were very internally focused, right? So some of our leadership roles, you know, we were hiring anything from 50 to 75% internally. Um, for our individual contributor roles, we had a very high internal, um, you know, uh, churn. And whilst that's a great thing for movement, it doesn't necessarily bring on board new people into the org, right? So we decided to refocus on uh, the external marketplace. And um, as a pillar, it meant that we had to reorganize you know, most of our operations within GTA to make sure that we were kind of optimized to go out and hire uh, and, and identify talent externally. Previously, we'd post a job, applications came in, we'd sift through the best. We'd probably hire you know, some great people by doing that but we weren't necessarily getting you know, the, the creme de la creme in the marketplace. We had to differentiate how we hired as well. So we created this kind of notion of categorizing all of our roles. So we started off with um, looking at all of our roles in the organization. And if you distill it down, we probably hire about 100 different types of role within the company. Um, and out of that, we probably hire 80% of them in the top 20 types of roles. So to give you an idea, things like technical account manager, software developer, um, sales, you know, um, account executive, for example, they're in the, like, the top five. Um, and we looked at how we went out to market for those types of roles, because um, currently we, we had a very kind of, you know, one size fits all model. So we would just take any role, work it the same way. So we categorized some of these roles and we called them either a core, pivotal or other. So we, um, and the differentiation between them meant that we could say, okay, a core role probably means that we have the highest number of headcount in Microsoft for that kind of role. It's a heavily repeatable role. We tend to recruit lots of that at volume. Um, you know, it's, it's essential for the running of our business, but having the very best person in the entire kind of well doing that role will have a difference, but it won't make that much difference you know, as an exponential um, position. Whereas we looked at pivotal roles, and these were a smaller number of subset of roles within our organization, and we said, okay, for these roles, we really want the very best person we can possibly hire in the market because they could have a massive impact in terms of our overall productivity. They have exponential you know, potential to, you know, to develop new things or create new ideas or innovate or sell to customers. So we really went big on, on you know, how we would work on those roles. Typically, the sourcing for those roles is also um, more complex, longer term. You know, we need a different kind of approach. We need to you know, court those kind of candidates for a longer kind of period of time. So we just changed how we did things. Uh, and importantly, also, we changed how we assessed candidates. So I'll come on to that. Um, recruitment culture was very much about we were used to talent coming to us. We had to shift our mindset and go out and get great talent. 
we were very much kind of siloed in, in individual countries. There was a UK team, a French team, a German team. In fact, every you know, major country for us had its own little recruitment team. It could be one poor recruiter on their own, or it could be you know, a large team. So we kind of regionalised what we were doing, and because of that, we got some great economies of scale. And then we also looked at you know, how we, um, from a data perspective, you know, there's you know, another massive buzzword, but how are we using data? So we started using data in terms of our sourcing funnels to identify where that talent is. We started using data to you know, segment our markets and understand our markets more importantly. We, we use data to influence hiring managers and HR managers in terms of you know, who we should go after and how we go after it. So we're using data much more kind of purposefully at the moment. Underpinning all that was we built a new sourcing team, uh, which I'm part of. Um, and in Europe, to give you an idea, there's about 40 in the sourcing team. And these are roles where we have a recruiter role and a sourcer role. A sourcer role is primarily external search. So think of them like a cross between a recruiter who fundamentally looks externally and uh, probably a headhunter, so a lot of research based. Whereas a recruiter manages recs end to end, they probably concentrate more on the core roles than the pivotal roles because they, they repeat a lot of volume in those kind of roles. Um, so just by that sort of differentiation of duties enabled us to go big on some of our you know, sourcing channels for those difficult to find roles. And assessment selection. So we, we kind of looked at how we're assessing candidates. Um, if you put in any search engine, you know, assessment at Microsoft or assessment at Google, you, you know, through loads of different websites, you can kind of see the kinds of um, you know, questions you're going to get asked. You can, they often people will even document different steps of the assessment process. Back in 2013, when I joined, it was fairly sporadic. We had some, you know, um, specific assessments processes for some roles. Other roles, you could you could go through the same process in another country and have a completely different experience as a candidate. Uh, also, more importantly, what we were assessing, right, was, if I say, much more kind of traditional. So by that, I mean, primarily, skills and experience and track record. That's really all we tended to look at. There was, a, there was a little bit of like that kind of gut feeling of, oh, yeah, I think they'll do well in the company. Maybe they won't. I don't know. Don't quite like them. I don't think they'll fit in. All that really horrible kind of feedback. I don't think they're a cultural fit for us, you know. And, and when we said to the managers, and I had the same conversation with the managers, what exactly do you mean by that? And they say, well, they're just not going to cut it in this business. It's, it's tough. And it was really subjective. Um, and we needed to work through that. Okay, so, uh, and, and we have done. So I'm going to talk about the new assessment selection process. And again, a bit of a disclaimer here. I'm sure that within the audience, there are organizations that already do this. For, for us, this has made a huge impact. It's made an impact because we've been able to scale it. So it's not just kind of transactional. We do this on one role, another role, we do other things. It's fairly consistent throughout the entire organization, whether you're looking at leadership roles, industry roles or, or early in career roles. Although early in career is slightly different because we look much more at potential. Um, we have, as I talked about, the recruiter role and talent officer role. Recruiter role in Microsoft has also evolved. Okay, so, um, and these three circles represent um, elements of kind of hiring. So the organization, we have, um, you know, sorts of talent want to go out to the market to go and hire. You know, we, these are strategic hires for us as an organisation, and we have um, you know high potential talent for the future. Hiring manager have their list of requirements for the kind, typically the kind of here and now. If you're in sales, it could be this particular kind of quarter we're in, or maybe the rest of this financial year. But typically, we find they tend to look much more kind of short term. Whereas for the organisation, we want to be hiring for the organisation for the you know next year and, and the next five, ten years in advance. And then we also have the kind of market, which is, you know, it doesn't necessarily always align with what, you know, we, um, we can actually go out and hire for that particular role. So the role of a recruiter uh, in all this had to fundamentally change from, I'm going to take an order, I'm going to go and fill that role, come back to you if I can't fill it and tell you why not, but more often than not, just kind of go through the motions, uh, to someone who's actually going to say, okay, look, I understand what you're saying. So, you know, qualifying a rec as we all would. Um, but then working through that and actually saying, you know, have you thought about this, the impact of this person over the longer term? Is this person really going to be adding any value to your overall team? How do they fit within the team structure? So asking some, some challenging questions to hiring managers to kind of change their perception from I'm hiring to fill this seat right now to I'm hiring for, this, for the organisation in the future. And, that, that was, and, and if I'm honest, that there's probably a capability issue for the recruiters. 
because you know a lot of the recruiters that we had had come from a model where they, they probably had 40, 50 recs, if I'm frank. And when you have that many recs, it's very, very difficult to have those kind of challenging conversations consistently. So we've reduced the rec load as well, which made a big difference. But giving them some training and giving them license to say, if the manager is kind of not giving you anything beyond just a few kind of technical skills, push back on them, challenge them, you know, refuse to work on that rec even until they, you know, work with you and actually kind of part with you. You know, we are ambassadors of the organisation, and, and, and therefore you know, we're part. We're a valid part of the HR team. We can we can partner with our HR colleagues and say, hey, come on, let's work at let's work on this, and let's work at the right level leadership team to actually understand what those other things actually are. So it's it's an interesting one. We used to survey hiring managers on every single hire we did, and we had a, a, a what we called CSAT survey uh, target of 8.7. It started off at like 8.3 and gradually rose to 8.7. And we you know we got 8.5, 8.6 out of 10. And everyone was like, oh, this is brilliant. We have a brilliant TA team. They're getting really great ratings from hiring managers, but. We suddenly stopped and thought, well, what are we actually doing? Are we actually helping hiring managers to fill roles with the best talent in the marketplace, helping shape what that talent needs to kind of look like, and then actually policing to make sure that we, you know, we are hiring the best talent and we're holding managers to account for what that talent needs to look like, or are we just kind of fulfilling that process and making sure they're happy and then you know, getting some good CSAT results as a result, you know, at, at the end of that? So we stopped doing it. And, and overnight, what we found is a lot of our recruiters were, it was kind of like a burden kind of lifted from their shoulders. All of a sudden, I'm, I'm, I'm okay to have that kind of discussion. I'm okay to challenge manager feedback on candidates because they're not going to feed back on me formally in this kind of CSAT that I'm held to account for. So that was a fairly bold move. And we didn't necessarily publish it, you know, um, to all the managers and say, well, by the way, you know, we're, we're now going to stop serving you. We're not interested in what you're going to say because clearly we are. But... We just kind of shifted how we took feedback from them, if that makes sense. Where we landed uh, from a cultural perspective, um, I mentioned growth mindset. So growth mindset is the kind of notion of hiring um, people that you know, have not necessarily reached their kind of full potential, that people, that, the way that we would approach kind of challenges and problems are, I can learn, you know, I can develop, I'm interested in what you have to say, you know, I'm, I'm inclusive, I'm not coming from that kind of fixed mindset of, you know what, I know it all, you know, I've got some, uh, you know, I, I'm an expert in my field, therefore I can't learn anything else. I offer best practice, best practice, you know, no one else can better what I'm doing, you know, and it's that kind of notion of Microsoft now, we're in a challenging market, right? So we, we're not the leading cloud provider by market share, um, but we're going to get there and we're growing just as fast and even faster than a lot of other competition, competitors. But in the 90s, we were really, you know, we were in the market on our own. And now we have a lot more competition. So we need people that are prepared to kind of think differently. So the growth mindset is one of the things is we, we hold very highly in our kind of assessment selection process. Um, other things, that leads to customer obsession, you know, putting the customers you know, first. I know a lot of other organizations have a similar ethos. Um, clearly, we need to be hiring from a diverse inclusion perspective. And one Microsoft is a kind of a reference to, we used to hire just for one uh, business segment but we didn't really think about how they might also kind of work across partnerships, across other areas. To give you an example, we'd hire someone for our professional services team, and they weren't really very connected to our enterprise sales team or our development team. So we're now thinking about, actually, when we hire someone, we need to, where else could they kind of move? We would encourage them to move between other orgs within the, within the company. All of that leads to kind of making a difference. We have values which, um, I'm, I'm not going to dwell on too much. In fact, I'm, I'm going to kind of skip through these because a lot of these kind of values are probably very, very similar to the values in, in, in other organisations. One thing I will say is, you know, we were saying, well, we need to hire people that, you know, broadly align to the values that we have as an organisation. How do we actually, how do we measure that? Like, you know, and that's an interesting one. When you get, when you get manager feedback, like, okay, so I assess them on X, Y, Z, from a values perspective, I didn't even touch upon that. And they say to you, well, how do you assess for values? Because isn't that something that kind of comes out when, when you get to know someone? So we, were th we kind of scratched our heads and thought, well, actually, how can we assess for values? I'll come on to that. So we formulated this talent assessment matrix, OK? So this, um, it's a fairly straightforward matrix. And as you can see, it's, it's, there's four boxes it's divided into, OK? So on the bottom, we have track record, 
uh, technical knowledge and, and credentials, i.e., their skill sets. Okay. So when we when we talk when so actually when we start qualifying a role with a manager to start with, you know they'll give us a job spec, and typically it's pretty horrible, right? So as they mostly are, and you know we'll we'll take it and say okay, fine, let's work through this in terms of a talent assessment matrix. Because if when you start with a role. Uh, when you're sourcing for a role, you really need to be thinking what the end goal needs to be in terms of you know, how you're going to assess someone and then ultimately hire someone and board the right person. So typically, managers are pretty good at you know, articulating what the track record kind of needs to be. So give an example. So from a sales perspective, it could be, I need someone who's retired their quota for the last three years and achieved over 100%. Pretty standard, right? Uh, it could be, I need someone who's developed um, at least three applications business grade um, and seen them through to implementation to give you an idea what that kind of track record kind of might look like. So very, very tangible, something that sources can kind of you know, latch onto when they're qualifying recs, sorry, qualifying candidates, um, and pretty standard. So um, industry experience kind of sits within that track record section as well. Um, technical knowledge and credentials is kind of what they do. So they, they might need to have some, some you know, .NET experience. They might need to have Visual Studio experience. They might need to have um, a structured-based sales technique. They might need to have um, some kind of um, you know, consulting um, methodology experience that you know, we're looking for, or, or PMO experience, or P, you know, Project Prince 2. So again, very kind of tangible. You know, it makes sure that they're kind of credible, gives you an indication that you know, most job specs have a whole bunch of skills, in fact, too many skills. So nothing there is really very revolutionary. I mean, we were pretty much doing that very well. Um, where it kind of changed, though, was when we started to kind of quantify from a competencies and values and culture perspective. So I'm not going to go through how to do competency-based assessment because I'm pretty sure most of us can, can kind of do that. But um, we, we looked at, you know, mapping within our organisation. We have competencies which are specific to roles and competencies which are specific to professions. And as part of the assessment and selection process, we made sure that when you qualify a rec, you would actually kind of define, okay, so here's the company competencies and here's the role-specific competencies. Which of these are you going to choose? All right? So if you can't remember the manager, that's fine. Here, here's the six com you know, company ones. Which of these are you going to assess or who's going to assess them in particular? Um, and you know, which of them is most important for us to assess as a TA team up front? And that kind of question sends a lot of managers into a bit of a spin. They're like, ah, oh, competencies, yeah, I need to only be thinking about that as an HR thing. Well, no, it isn't an HR thing. It's just behaviours. It's how someone who's going to arrive, who's got the kind of skills and abilities and track record, is actually then going to operate when they actually land in the company. So it's really important. Um, so we found that we had to kind of almost kind of spoon feed them. If we ask them outright and expect them to kind of know it, many of them would have known it, but they've got 10 other things going on at the same time. So it helped if we actually kind of, you know, gave them some, some options and chose from that. Also, when we design the um, assessment kind of um, process, and it might be, say, a three-stage process, we'd say, OK, here's all the competencies we want to assess. Who's going to do what? And that, I mean, that was, sounds obvious, but it's really important that you don't just kind of, you know, put all these competencies in, in one document and say, right, off you go, go and do it. Because invariably, they all, what they tend to do is they tend to try and assess them all, we found, and then they would end up, you know, uh, all having kind of conflicting, slightly conflicting kind of views, and it become a bit messy. And also, you know, in an, in an interview, we found that Realistically, if you're going to do more than two or three, you're going to struggle. If you're going to do them properly, properly probe into them. So uh, finally, values and culture. And this was, this was the one that even our recruitment team struggled with. How the hell do you actually assess for values and culture? Um, and I'll kind of come on to that in, in a bit more detail uh, in a slide or two's time. But essentially, when we qualify a role, each of those four elements we, we touch upon as, as equal importance. And, and this is the tough thing, because managers, they will always look at it and go, yeah, but, you know, unless they've got .NET experience, then I can't do anything with them at all. There's no point even having them on board, right? So, you know, and this is where your powers of negotiation as a recruiter start to kind of come in to say, okay, you know, um, what other languages are like .NET? Talk me through that, you know, and, and get two or three maybe options, and then start kind of qualifying that rec to say, quantify it. How long would it actually take to actually cross-train someone from that skill set to the skill set we need. Where have you done that in the past? I mean, why have you never done that in the past if you haven't done that? I know that happens because I see it on candidate CVs all the time. You know, how equipped are you as an organisation to kind of do that? And, and, you know, you start to kind of question all of these kind of elements to come up with this assessment um, criteria against a rec. So it's 
again, you know, I've seen this happen in many other organisations. We tend to assess all of these things, but maybe what we've done in Microsoft a bit more uh, in the last couple of years is start to kind of structure it in a way that makes sense that we can kind of tick off each of these different elements. So this is, this is an example kind of competency framework. So these four, uh, six up here, they're the, they're the standard kind of company um, competencies. So when, you, when we're designing assessment you know, criteria, we'll say, which of these are most important for you? It's a sales role. OK, influencing for impact is probably there. Driving for results, customer focus, or collaboration. They're all really important, but you get them to almost kind of stat rank them. And, and, it, and sometimes managers kind of have, have trouble kind of doing that. They're leaders, and you say, well, talk to me about one of your top performers. You know, where, would you, you know, where would they rank in all that? What do they really, you know, where do they really excel in all that kind of stuff? The other competencies here, the ones which I think were green, but not really green on this slide, they're specific to the role. Each of our roles has those, and, and um, we typically kind of pick and choose some of those. So each of the maybe three to five stages, we would maybe choose, you know, who's going to do what competencies at what stage, and be very kind of prescriptive about it to make sure that everyone knows what they're going to assess. One of the other things we found is that people tend to like to assess everything in an interview, and they'll give you the feedback on the things you ask them to, and they'll also give you feedback on stuff that is not relevant to what you've asked them to do. And then all of a sudden you get into this horrible discussion between managers who have conflicting views on a candidate. And it's like, why is that conflict there? I didn't even ask you to assess that. I appreciate your feedback here, but are you being really objective in terms of your questioning to, to achieve that? Um, so culture's a biggie for us. So we, we looked at how um, we were going to assess it, and we thought, and then we looked through our competency, you know, list of competencies we had, and then we mapped them. We actually, we have a light bulb moment. We mapped them to some of the, um, you know, uh, elements of our culture that we're looking for. So growth mindset, for example, for example, you know, mapped very nicely to our, um, you know, competency of adaptability. And if, you know, with it, we've actually got a nice tool which kind of, you, you know, you type in the competency in the role, and it brings up a whole list of different questions and it shows you what the kind of answers might be or how candidates could demonstrate their competency at different levels in the organisation. Um, so adaptability was a, was a nice one to kind of demonstrate that value. So you're asking them questions that give candidates an opportunity to demonstrate, you know, how they may operate and how they tick effectively. So you're trying to remove that kind of feedback you might get from managers, which is along the lines of, yeah, culturally not really a fit for us, you know. Uh, and so you're able to kind of quantify that and say, well, what exactly do you mean? So which, how did you assess that? So adaptability, how did you look at adaptability? How did you assess that? Uh, and then talk them through that. So we, we map them, you know, one by one. And, uh, you know, we looked at, uh, you know, inclusive kind of suite of questions to do that, okay? Interesting the kind of results we kind of got back from that. You know, managers found it very hard probably for the first six months to give us that objective kind of feedback we were looking for. You know, we had to double back with them and train them and coach them on, in terms of the feedback we were looking for, effectively. Uh, values was another one. We looked at, you know, how can we, how can you really do that objectively? We found a competency, um, some questions which map very nicely to the competency values we're looking for on the left. So if you ask a candidate in classic, um, are, you a, are you a passionate person at work? You know, I go, yeah, yeah, of course I am. I'm, I'm very passionate. Look at me. Uh, and you're like, okay, fine. That's a bad question. So we, we might ask questions around here. Give me, give me an example of where you showed, you know, um, you know, high levels of drive for something, went above and beyond. And you're looking for examples of where they may have you know, demonstrated a passion for something that then drove to a successful outcome or an outcome that they were really looking to drive towards. So um, we, we're kind of using our competency framework to look at things beyond just the behaviours around that we're kind of looking for within or We're looking for values and cultures through it. So I don't know if I've talked a lot and I've paused for any kind of questions on, on this, if there are any so far, if you're still with me. Okay. So all of that was said and done, and we, um, we, we, we rolled out, and I'll talk about the training in a minute, but we rolled this new model out, and then we realised probably further into this than we should have done, that as a TA team, talent acquisition team, we weren't very consistent in terms of what we were giving managers in terms of our screening. So, uh, you know, no, no brainer. We rolled out a very structured, um, you know, screening template, and 
you know, I, I personally hate forms like most people, but this is more of a prompt to make sure that when we're qualifying a candidate, having a conversation with a candidate, we're doing our due diligence as a TA team to make sure that they're going to fit for us and, and we're going to fit for them, importantly. Um, so on the left is much more the kind of, you know, track record, motivations, the standard kind of stuff. On the right, you know, we, we actually kind of speak to managers and say, look, we're going to do a kind of mini CBI interview with a candidate, start to assess some of these kind of competencies. Um, you know, here's, you know, let, let's talk through what we're going to do and then what you're going to do. And then as a result of our screening, we can give you some steers as to where you need to kind of double click and probe. Uh, and they, they loved it. You know, they, they actually, it takes a lot longer to fill in anything from half an hour to kind of 45 minutes, you know, sometimes post an interview. Some, some of them actually doing it on the phone, tidying it up afterwards. But from productivity perspective, the number of volume of kind of candidates we can do this with drops because there's more in depth. But we, we feel as though we're doing much kind of more due diligence on our candidates that we are kind of bringing forward. And can, the feedback from candidates is they kind of like it because organisations, when they speak to a recruiter and they do like, you know, why are you looking to move? What's your salary? What's your notice period? Okay, I'll send your CV across. They're like, really? Like, is that all you actually do with your with your candidates? Is that is that really going to add any any add any value? Um, so the feedback from them has been quite positive. Uh, one of the things we also did, um, you know, is there's a standard kind of online training module. So talent acquisition work with um, a partner to create this module. So it's good stuff um, and. It, it answers to all kinds of stuff. Um, it's kind of, think of it as like a 101 interviewing at Microsoft. Most managers we hire tend to have, you know, have done some interviewing before. Um, and so sometimes it's about showing them this is kind of what we expect. Um, sometimes it's about breaking some old habits. You know, I'm under no illusion. Some of the managers are, you know, are loving it. And some of them are kind of like, meh. And some of them probably don't do, do it, although it is mandatory, by the way. And... Importantly, we baked in this kind of kind of teaser of we, we interview on potential, we interview on their performance. You know, so to that playing to that very much, you know, the talent assessment matrix we talked about earlier on. So when they join, they have to do this before they start interviewing, um, and so they they can't escape it, and it kind of calls out some of their kind of fundamentals. We realise that frankly, that's not going to do the job. So we um, we start also rolling out this. Um, what we call be a great assessor of talent. We love our acronym, BGAP, we call it. Um, and this is a much more kind of formal uh, half a day session that TA runs with our managers. We try and capture an entire um, room full uh, and do it. And we've, there's pros and cons of doing it within you know, departments or divisions versus you know, a whole mix of managers because often the kind of what you get from managers is some really great live examples that you can kind of play on and work with. Um, so, yeah, I mean, and this talks through in very kind of 101 fashion, this is how you do a competency interview. This is our talent assessment matrix. When you speak to a recruiter, this is what we're going to be asking. And by the way, this is why we're going to ask you for it as well. And, um, you know, we also found that we had to train our TA teams to do it as well, which was quite interesting. So, um, clearly, you know, there's, this is a you know, big investment, you know, a bunch of managers in the room, half a day, lots of arrangements, lots of logistics, so we need to make sure it's high impact. So we had a lot of kind of trainings to do our own TA teams to actually kind of deliver this. Um, and, I, and I would say, you know, the feedback from them is all really positive. They kind of go into it thinking, oh great, HR training, I'm going to love this. And, and a lot of them come, come out thinking, actually I can see the business value for doing this. Like, you know, I can see one of the other things we've done quite a bit of is we give them a digest of people that we've hired who we would class as transformational talent because they don't traditionally meet the same mould of people that we tend to hire previously. Uh, and we give them a digest on a monthly basis. And you know, here's 10 people, um, here's where they joined, and by the way, here's what they've started to do or here's what they've done. Um, and that is as powerful as any of this kind of training because they start reading it and going, oh yeah, that's interesting. We hired someone there from FMCG with no tech experience and they're nailing it. So well, who, who did that? They, they find out who hired them. They then, you know, speak within their own communities and go, okay, well, I'm prepared to give this a bit of a go. Because there's a big kind of risk aversion sort of thing going on. Um, so the big gap's been really good, I think. Um, and the other thing I'm going to highlight, and there's, there's a bunch of other stuff, but the other thing I'll highlight is um, this course called Dialogue, Dialogue Across Differences. Um, someone else uh, is talking about unconscious bias today, and if you're not aware of what unconscious bias is, then definitely go to that session. So from a, from a recruiting perspective... 
You know, unconscious bias is a, is a real enemy of hiring transformational talent. It's a real hire, it's an enemy of hiring people who are just different to you, frankly. So we, we, we established, we kind of piggybacked off this. It was, a, it, was, it was actually set up and run as an inclusion um, course for managers internally, but we also, you know, we looked at it and said, well, actually, this is, this, is more, this is as relevant for inclusion of those we already have as it is for those we're trying to hire. So, um, and the headlines, if you don't know what it is, is effectively you know, the biases that we have as, as, as humans, you know, can have a huge impact in terms of um, you know, the experience and, and how we view CVs all the way through to how we interview and how we ultimately think about those individuals kind of coming in to work for us as an organisation. So whilst you can, you know, you can't completely get rid of your, your unconscious biases, you know, being aware that you actually even have unconscious bias, being aware you have conscious bias, and how you manage that as a manager can have a big impact. So managers, you know, this is, this is really insightful stuff. We found that very useful. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to kind of conclude with just some kind of points that we've picked up on and, and learned. You know, one thing we, we kind of took for granted was that managers were good assessors, um, and assessing is a, is a skill like anything else, right? And it, it's a muscle that you need to build and not muscle you need to continue to work out. And we found that some of the best results and some of the best hirers we've got actually probably weren't so, so hot a couple of years ago. And they've invested in themselves you know, with that kind of growth mindset ethos to, to develop. We've given them the time and energy to do it. And they've really responded well. So um, when I started in recruitment, I kind of had this perception that I'd send candidates, a manager would interview them, and they'd come and go, no, no, they're not right, not right, send me more. And then I keep getting this kind of feedback, and it kind of didn't really, I didn't really know why they weren't going to get hired. And I just, for me, I kind of thought, the manager must know what they're looking for. They must be good at this. So I'm not even going to question them. Why should I? I'm just a recruiter. Um, and we figured that actually, you know, what they don't know, why would they? You know, we, they need our support. Hiring transformational, you know, or diverse, or talent that doesn't, you know, necessarily look like a complete shoe in is a tough gig, it's a tough ask for them. So we needed to support them. Um, so that's one thing we learned. Um, you know, getting alignment sounds obvious, but to that point where you get managers kind of going off and assessing things they want to assess rather than what you want to objectively assess. Building consistencies, it, it builds in kind of conflict within, within views. And typically what we find is when everyone says, yeah, let's hire, we hire. When everyone says, no, let's not hire, then we don't hire. If two or three say hire and one or two say no hire, you know, previously we go no hire. Sorry, default, no. They've got to have a kind of three or four or five yeses out of six uh, before we hire. Whereas actually, you know, it's, a, it's absolutely fine to have kind of diff conflicting views in the assessment process. Um, but often it's recruiters that kind of need to, to be the kind of shepherd to kind of align and orchestrate this decision, which sometimes is often seen as a very bold decision. Right. That's, that was an interesting one. Um, when we looked at defining what transformational talent looks like within each individual team, it helped to kind of go in at GM level, frankly. If you try and do it individually at hiring manager level, you'll get probably 100 different answers to that. You might get 50 of them with the same themes, but you know, what we started with was it's quite senior within the org, um, gained alignment within, to be honest, within our Western Europe teams, shared that wider within the rest of the European teams, and then saw what kind of consistencies there were across not just different you know, segments of our business, but different geos as well. So you know, starting at the top was a, was a learn we thought was good. We tried it transactionally, individually, and it just didn't work too much. Too much going on. Um, yeah, making it clear, consistent, you know, spoon feeding managers to say, here's your assessment. By the way, you're probably going to be assessed in the same kind of roles quite often. So st we started with our top 10, right? We simplified it, gave them that kind of criteria and said, right, here, we'll, we'll start with this. Probably isn't going to be perfect, but we're going to iterate on it, okay? And, and that, that worked quite well. Um, Coaching managers is a really important piece. You know, there was, we were never going to get them through this mandatory training. We were never going to um, you know, deliver a half-day training session. We were never going to give them you know, email support. And then all of a sudden, they're amazing at it. You know, we had to kind of check back. And it tends to, the, the best kind of interactions tend to be individually with a recruiter or with a manager to say, how did that interview go? You know, how would you have done things differently? How can you improve? And as a recruiter, when you've got 15 other things going on, that's a tough, tough one to try and find time to make, to, to do. Um, but we really encourage recruiters to do that. And 
you know, one by one, we started to kind of coach managers and, and have those kind of discussions, give them additional kind of support. And we've seen some, some real impact as a result of that. You know, as a, as a recruiter, learning from assessor feedback is, for, for me, it's the one place to know whether or not they're, they're following your assessment process or not. You can tell. You read what they write in terms of feedback. And if they don't write anything, then massive alarm bells are going, right? But we often, you know, we'll get some feedback that aligns very much to our process. And occasionally there's feedback in there that is either not relevant to what they should be assessing or maybe not aligned with, with, what, you know, with what they should be doing um, overall. And picking them up on that and saying, look, I've read your feedback. You know, why did you write that? You know, what, how does that relate to that competency? Talk me through it. So these are, these are typically challenging conversations with TA recruiters to have with a manager who traditionally might have been not used to being questioned about what they've been doing. So that, that helps us out. Um, one training type doesn't suit all, you know, online, face-to-face, -face, or corporate-based training. You know, having a variety of different options tends to work, sounds pretty obvious. We came from a, a world where, as I said, like if, if there are four assessments, if two of them were no, two of them were yes, we'd go no. Whereas, you know, even if we went, as a recruiter, we tended to kick off uh, maybe if we did an assessment centre, you know, we're going to hire all these people unless there are particularly good reasons not to hire them. Some real bold statements, quite, you know, aggressive almost to say, these people have gone through, a, you know, a hell of a lot of screening to get here. You know, we've spoken to over, you know, 100 candidates on our searches, quantify what we've done. So really, we want to hire them, but you're going to take, you know, if there are reasons why we shouldn't, then let us know. That is a very different kickoff to, here's a bunch of candidates, tell me if you want to hire them. You know, and it, it kind of almost, in some managers it works, some of them it doesn't have as much impact, but it kind of shifts them away from screening in, to, you know, from screening out to screening in. So, something to take away. Diversity is, in our industry, in the tech industry, is a real challenge for every business in our world. And clearly, if we're all going after the same talent, whatever diversity might mean for you, there's, there's, there's a finite pool. So by broadening that pool out of people that we would see as transformational to our business, then stands to reason we're going to be able to hire more. So um, we use this as a huge leverage to hire different types of profiles. And, and it's very, very difficult to try and quantify that, because if it's a male, female diversity, for example, you can, you can measure that. But if it's someone coming in from a different industry that otherwise we hadn't hired before that has a real impact, then you know, it's very difficult to measure, but it has a huge impact on our business. And as I said, sharing success stories is, is something we found being quite, quite a good um, method for doing that. Um, finally, and pr possibly most importantly, that you know, if the business see it as a, as a business, uh, as an HR initiative, it's not going to work. They need to kind of grasp the kind of why this is a good thing. You know, um, and then if they don't grasp that, they're probably not necessarily going to follow through on this kind of stuff. They might say they do, uh, but then maybe they don't. Um, and if I'm honest, we, we, we're getting much more traction on this than we ever have done. Um, I'm under no illusions, we're not perfect, and I said that at the beginning. We're making some huge differences here. We're making, and, and the way I see it as a barometer is how we actually, uh, the sorts of profiles we're bringing in and how they align to our previous hires we used to make. Are they different? Are they just coming from IBM and you know, companies like that? Um, nothing against IBM, great company. We hire probably more from IBM than any other company still, but um, it's more traditional to us. You know, if I'm seeing companies making hires from other organizations or even people from outside the kind of corporate world have got really great differing experience they can bring some true diversity to us, and that's a great thing. So, um, yeah, I think I probably would leave it on that kind of note. I've covered a lot of ground there in sort of 45 minutes. So if there are any questions, happy to take them.